Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today, we have two wonderful speakers, Joachim and Sirvisen, who are both at Stanford University, working under Dr. David Seit on Internet Scale Open Participation Consensus, or aka the Technical Foundations of Blockchains. Um, today, they are here to present their work titled Securing Proof of Stake Nakamoto Consensus Under Bandwidth Constraint. So I'm going to let you both take it from here and expand on that topic um, a bit more. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're talking today about uh, securing proof of stake Nakamoto consensus under a bandwidth constraint. This is joint work with Sri Watson, who will uh, talk in the second half of the talk, um, Lei, who is also in the audience, and our advisors, uh, David and Mohammed. If you're curious, after the talk, um, we have a preprint, uh, which is up on archive. Uh, you find the link here uh, in the bottom. Uh, and yeah, this uh, will be presented later in the year at the Science of Blockchain Conference. So let's get started. I'm going to spoiler uh, the, the, the full talk uh, in one slide. So here are the you know, 60 second version uh, of what you're about to see in the next uh, half an hour or so. We're going to revisit uh, the bounded delay network model, um, in particular from the perspective of equivocations. So that is multiple blocks being produced for the same block production opportunity in proof of stake. And um, this gives the adversary an opportunity to, uh, to spam the network with uh, a whole ton of blocks uh, and uh, puts a question mark behind the bounded delay network model. Um, because of this, um, we're proposing a new uh, network model, a bandwidth constraint network model. Um, this network model gives us a new degree of freedom in designing our consensus protocols because now it, uh, there's a new uh, functionality, so to speak, uh, which are download rules. And um, the protocol uh, has to specify uh, what download rule it uses um, in order to fetch bl uh, blocks from the network under this bandwidth constraint. Um, we then go on to show that the you know, popular longest chain um, consensus protocol of Nakamoto under the canonical download the longest header chain uh, download rule is insecure. Um, and then uh, we present to you our, uh, you know, simple replacement download rule, which uh, we call the download freshest block rule. You will see later uh, what it refers to. Um, and we will prove that uh, under this download rule, uh, the protocol is actually secure. Um, so before we get started, or as we get started, uh, let's do a quick recap of proof of stake longest chain uh, type protocols. Uh, this is a family of protocols. It started with a proof of work longest chain um, by Nakamoto in Bitcoin, and it has since been uh, translated to the proof of stake setting, uh, for example, in Sleepy or in Ouroboros. Um, you see here uh, my network uh, with the participants, and uh, they're growing a blockchain on, on the left. Um, in this uh, setup, uh, we have a notion of, of time, and time uh, is divided into time slots. And uh, nodes basically, so you know, as time progresses and we step through the time slots, nodes uh, take turns in producing blocks. There could be time slots in which there is a block produced, there could be time slots uh, that are empty, and nodes take turn in, in producing blocks. How exactly does this work? So uh, let's look into uh, you know, what uh, some nodes think as uh, they are in a time slot and they're trying to produce a block. So here we're looking into the head of, of two of these nodes, and they're asking themselves, hey, am I eligible to produce a, a block here? And uh, in order to resolve that question, uh, what they do is uh, they all have uh, a secret key corresponding to their node identity, and they evaluate a verifiable random function on the current time slot. And depending on what the output is, when the output is uh, smaller than a certain threshold, then that means that they're eligible to produce a block or not. So in this case, uh, only the node here that is proposing transaction set three is eligible to produce a block. Um, the other node is not. Okay, so there is a block produced. It can also happen that in some time slots, um, two nodes are eligible to produce a block. That's okay. Then uh, we see a fork in our blockchain. Um, so two blocks at the same time. Uh, these forks get resolved in later slots when there is only a single, uh, 
a single block, and that single block then you know picks one of the uh, forks of equal length uh, and puts a block there, and then this becomes uh, the the longest chain again. Um, now that we have our blockchain structure, uh, the last thing, so I, I explained to you, uh, nodes produce blocks on top of the longest chain. Um, the only thing I need to explain to you still is uh, how do we extract a ledger from this? There's a consensus protocol after all. The way it works is using the T deep rule, uh, very similar to the K deep rule in Bitcoin, where uh, you take the longest chain, you chop off uh, the, the blocks at the end uh, that come from the most recent T time slots, and then you confirm uh, all the blocks that are left in the prefix. Okay. And the last uh, thing that is always good to, to keep in mind in this setting is uh, we have adversaries in this network. We don't know who they are, but uh, we denote the adversarial stake fraction uh, with beta as in bad. Okay, those are the bad guys. Cool. Now that we have uh, recapped proof of stake uh, longest chain protocol, um, let's also revisit uh, the security guarantee we have for them. Uh, which is uh, typically these protocols are analyzed in uh, what we could call the bounded delay model. Um, so in the bounded delay model, it is assumed that the network delay between any two honest nodes is under control of the adversary, but it has to be within some known delay per bound uh, capital delta. And under this network model, uh, we can then get a security theorem uh, which says something to the effect, well, if the network delay is bounded by this capital delta, which is a parameter that we want to know because we want to tune the protocol to it, and the adversarial stake fraction beta and the block production rate lambda satisfy this uh, complicated looking expression here, we're going to talk about later uh, where this comes from, um, then Nakamoto's longest chain consensus protocol satisfies safety and liveness with overwhelming probability. And safety and liveness, uh, again, just as a, as a quick reminder, um, safety means that, so every node outputs a ledger, right? And safety means that these ledgers that are output by two honest nodes at two points in time are consistent. So one is a prefix of the other. They may not uh, contain different transactions at a certain position. And liveness means that uh, every transaction uh, that uh, is input to an honest node uh, enters every honest nodes ledger within you know reasonable amount of time. The big question, of course, is uh, how true is this networking assumption, right? Um, in particular, you see from from uh, the bounded delay model uh, here, there is no notion of capacity. There is no notion of you know maximal throughput. There is no criterion here to the effect. Uh, you know, as long as you don't send more than a million messages per second, um, then this works. And it stands to reason uh, that that this might not be the case in in real networks. So uh, this delay bound here is independent of the network load. But um, if you run some experiments, so here we took uh, the 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 Cardano implementation in some uh, tiny test net, and we varied uh, the block production rate. Uh, so that the network load uh, is increasing. So on the x-axis, you see the number of blocks that we're sending uh, per slot. And on the y-axis, you see uh, the resulting uh, block delay. And uh, you can tell that um, the, the more blocks you're sending, um, the, the larger your delay gets. And maybe that's not all too surprising. After all, these are physical systems, and they don't have infinite capacity. Uh, so this is sad. It shows that congestion uh, matters. Um, you need to somehow capture uh, bandwidth constraints, um, and you need to somehow um, yeah, talk about these limits. This is particularly aggravated um, in the case of uh, proof of stake because of equivocation spamming. So to see why that is the case, uh, let's revisit this uh, note that you know we looked into their head uh, earlier. Um, and this node is trying to produce a block. And in order to do this, uh, the node uh, checks its VRF output. And if the VRF output is below a certain threshold, uh, then it gets to produce a block. OK, so this block uh, is made up from two parts, from a header and from content, block content. Um, the header includes 
a bunch of metadata is typically relatively small. Um, it includes the node's identity I, it includes the current time slot or the time slot in which the lottery was won. It includes uh, a VRF proof uh, pi. It includes uh, the parent, uh, a reference to the parent block. It includes a hash of the transactions that are supposed to go into this block. And there is also some signature to bind it all together. And so this block header uh, gets bound to a block content and the block content typically is much larger. It contains um, all the transactions that are included in this block. Uh, and so when uh, this honest node um, is eligible to produce a block according to the VRF, then it composes this block, puts all the information together and sends it out to the network. Great. Um, what if this node is adversarial? Uh, so if this node is adversarial, um, then it can actually reuse, see, there, is no, there are no transactions in, in the block production lottery, right? There are no transactions input to the VRF. Uh, that's intentional because otherwise you could change the transactions and uh, get more uh, lottery tickets and, and more attempts at producing a block. So you can grind on the transactions. In order to avoid this, the transactions are not part of the VRF input. But as a result of this, um, if a node wins block production opportunity, then it can put out a whole bunch of blocks, all with different transactions. And uh, it can send, all of these are, are different blocks, and they're all offered to the network. And um, you know, suddenly we have a huge amount of blocks uh, that are being offered uh, to the network because of this adversarial strategy. And um, we've seen earlier that this puts a question mark uh, behind the uh, the delay bound. So equivocation spamming really aggravates this problem of congestion, and uh, it prompts us to to look uh, more into uh, bandwidth limits uh, and congestion and their effect on security. Note also that this is not a problem in in proof of work. This is a genuine uh, to proof of stake because in proof of work the difficulty is calibrated in such a way that you get a global uh, cap on the rate at which blocks are produced. So it is not the case that if an adversary gets to produce one block, then the adversary can equivocate and, and produce a whole bunch of blocks. And so in proof of work, that's not a problem. In proof of stake, uh, this arises. Um, so our goal uh, in this work um, is uh, to introduce a formal network model that is supposed to be relatively close to the bounded delay model, um, but we would like to be able uh, for it to be uh, to capture uh, the performance under network congestion, and in particular to be able to reason about the security of protocols under uh, attacks such as this one that is based on equivocation spamming in the proof of stake setting. And we should note that this is not. Um, you know, this has been this this problem has been observed before. Um, for example, in this uh, paper reference here above, proof of stake blockchain protocols with near optimal throughput, where the authors realized that uh, in order to to talk about throughput in a meaningful way, you need a model that somehow captures congestion. But once you have a model that somehow captures congestion, then in a proof of stake setting, um, you're faced with these equivocation spamming based attacks. And uh, the authors in that paper um, are giving us a conditional security statement that basically says, um, that basically rules out these equivocation spamming attacks. And uh, this is kind of the, the open question uh, that we're trying to provide an answer to uh, in this work. Um, so that is the, the first thing um, that we're putting forth is a formal network model that can capture congestion and hence allows us to reason about security uh, under equivocations in proof of stake. Um, the second thing is um, that we're looking here for uh, a, a protocol that is still somewhat close uh, to the longest chain family, um, and we're looking for a simple um, for a simple modification or for a simple protocol um, that uh, yeah that works well with with the longest chain paradigm simply because uh, it's a it's a prominent family of protocols um, and we would like to be able to reason about. Uh, how it behaves in this setting. Um, and the third point is we're looking here for, for provable security. So we are putting forth a formal model and a formal analysis 
and you might disagree uh, with us, but we think that's actually good. So, so now we have a model that we can that we can talk about and uh, that we can pull apart and, and you know discuss what we like or do not like about it. This is in contrast to a bunch of heuristics uh, that are circulating uh, mostly in you know implementations of blockchains where um, you know people drop equivocations. There's all sorts of heuristics how to handle equivocations. Um, but to our knowledge, um, there is no formal analysis on these. Um, we simply don't know whether they work or not. So here we're specifically interested in, in provable security. With that being said, um, let's uh, dive into the network model. So you see here on the right-hand side, uh, our network, uh, we have our nodes. Um, they're talking to each other via some peer-to-peer uh, -peer gossip uh, network protocol. And uh, the process it works is like this. So if a node uh, produces a block, it submits it uh, to the gossip network. Um, the uh, headers, remember the headers are, are very short pieces of information. Um, they are uh, then propagated uh, with a bounded delay of delta H. So uh, they go out to everybody. Um, and then based on the block headers that uh, nodes have seen, um, they use a download priority rule uh, to decide what block they would like to download now. Um, so block content is uh, what dominates uh, the, the download bandwidth. So then they request to download a certain block content from the network. And uh, this block content is then provided to them uh, from the network, but the, the content is uh, subject to a bandwidth constraint of C blocks per second, for example. Um, and finally, uh, the adversary has uh, a special power, um, just like in the bounded delay model where the, the uh, actual network delay uh, is under control of the adversary. Here, the adversary uh, basically can uh, has control over the effective bandwidth um, at each node uh, through being able uh, to push headers and blocks and uh, to nodes and to override the bandwidth constraint that way. So um, yeah, the coming from this model, the new degree of freedom we get in designing our consensus protocols uh, is this download rule, right? Which is a mapping from uh, you know looking at a certain uh, block header tree. Um, what is the next block that a node wants to download, wants to request from the network? Um, this is now something that we get to design for our protocol. A canonical rule for a longest chain protocol um, would be to download, to look at the header tree, determine the longest chain in the header tree, um, and then to download whatever blocks are missing towards the longest header chain. Uh, so we call this the longest header chain download rule. Um, and it is canonical in the sense that uh, Bitcoin uses this rule, basically. Um, Cardano uses this rule, basically. Um, and it seems to work well with the longest chain paradigm. However, um, there are some caveats. There are some, there are some problems with it. And I'm going to uh, show an attack now, basically. Um, so let's suppose we are starting out with these uh, three blocks here, one, two, four. Um, they're all downloaded. All honest nodes uh, have already seen them and they have downloaded the content. Um, and let's suppose in slots six and seven, uh, the adversary gets to produce some blocks. So the adversary has block production opportunities, but the adversary withholds uh, their blocks. They are not being uh, dispersed for now. Um, then in slot number nine, an honest guy gets to produce a block. This block number nine here. Uh, the header is disseminated in the network. And just before honest guys are about to, to start downloading the content of this block, the adversary releases this, um, its two blocks, six and seven. So now by uh, the longest header chain rule, right? A node that sees all these block headers but hasn't downloaded anything up uh, beyond the block number four, um, this node uh, now prefers to download block six and seven uh, over block nine, simply because six and seven is, uh, is the longer chain than the chain through nine. So nodes start downloading block number six. When it's done downloading block number six, it actually turns out that some of the transactions in that block were invalid. Um, so that chain needs to be abandoned. That chain gets thrown out. The node would now want to go back and download block number nine, but actually 
the adversary releases a new uh, equivocation uh, for slot six and seven and puts out this new chain, six prime, seven prime. And hey, according to the longest header chain, uh, this is now the longest, uh, the longest chain, right? So instead of downloading uh, block number nine, we should now be downloading six prime and seven prime. Um, you might already guess where this is going. It unfortunately turns out that this block six prime uh, is invalid. Um, you can only tell after downloading the transactions because this is, uh, you know, turns out the last transaction in the block uh, is invalid, but you will only know, know after spending your download bandwidth. Um, notice that in the whole process, the, the tip of the downloaded chain um, or the downloaded longest chain has not moved at all, right? In particular, nobody other than the node that produced block number nine has node uh, has block number nine. So if in block in slot eleven a new block is produced, uh, then this block gets produced on top of the downloaded longest chain, right? It would be dangerous to produce blocks on top of uh, of uh, blocks that you haven't downloaded simply because you know you see the headers. Because what if these blocks turn out to be invalid, and then your block also gets lost? So if there's an, another honest block. Uh, in slot number 11, uh, then that extends four again. So it kind of has the same fate as, as block number nine, right? Because of course the adversary keeps uh, pushing out equivocations using these opportunities six and seven. And um, yeah, it might not be all too disappointing, but also that block turns out to be uh, invalid after you've downloaded it. So you see roughly where this is going. Um, this, is a, this is a liveness violation uh, under the protocol rules. Um, and in fact, uh, we, we implemented uh, Cardano's download logic and uh, we implemented this attack in a small test net. Um, and indeed you can tell that, you know, if there is no attack, you get a certain uh, honest chain growth rate. And uh, if you launch this attack, uh, then the chain growth rate, um, you know, breaks down to, to only a fraction. And if you're a little familiar with longest chain protocols and this, um, uh, is a warning sign to you because uh, the honest chain growth rate is kind of what makes these protocols secure. It, these protocols are based on the honest chain outgrowing any adversarial chain, but if the honest chain growth rate breaks down, then the adversary can start producing uh, competing chains and can start deconfirming blocks. And in fact, that's the case of so this attack is not just a, a, a liveness violation, it's also a safety violation. Um, because the adversary now has, since the honest chain is not growing anymore, the adversary has all time in the world uh, to go back uh, in the chain and uh, fork off uh, earlier in time, produce longer chains, uh, and deconfirm blocks. So this also implies a safety violation. This mechanism also gives you a hint, or maybe you know by now you're a little uh, uncomfortable with the, with the situation. You're like somehow something seems odd, right? Because um, why eventually honest nodes should just give up on these slots six and seven, right? Why are they? Why do they keep downloading uh, blocks from six and seven, even though they've already been burned many times, right? There are many new blocks, um, fresher blocks that came more recently. Something seems to be wrong with these slots six and seven. Why do you keep downloading those? Why don't you go for uh, more recent blocks? And uh, indeed, uh, this is kind of the, the basic intuition uh, behind the rule, the download rule that we are proposing, uh, which is that honest nodes should be downloading uh, freshest blocks. And freshest blocks means uh, the freshest block is the block with the most recent block production opportunity. And it's immediately clear that if the most recent block production opportunity was honest, uh, then the freshest block um, is honest and uh, uh, honest nodes will, will be downloading towards this block. So somehow this gives an intuition that uh, something, you know, going following the freshest block uh, might be a better thing to do. And indeed, um, it turns out that this uh, freshest block download rule um, allows us to, to, to prove that the protocol uh, is secure. Um, so here's another uh, illustration of this fact. So suppose you have uh, this, this chain downloaded uh, of one, two, four. Everybody has downloaded this chain. It so happens that the blocks of, of two and four were adversarial in this case, um, but that's fine. If the adversary doesn't put invalid transactions in there, then, uh, you know, honest guys will still download this. 
And now in, in slot number six, a uh, an honest block comes around, right? Um, this honest block is built on top of copies of two and four. So the adversary has released uh, copies with conflicting transactions. This time they're, they're valid transactions. And um, the adversary perhaps has pushed these blocks to the node that produced uh, block number six. Um, but in any case, block number six is produced on this, uh, on this chain. And since this is now the, the freshest block, um, that's what honest the guys are going to download towards. So uh, they then go back from the freshest block, according to the block headers, uh, to where this chain merges back with uh, the longest downloaded chain or with the, you know, with the downloaded chain, with downloaded blocks. And they start downloading um, whatever is uh, missing in their prefix in terms of transactions. And later on, uh, you will see that the proof critically hinges on the fact that this prefix, if it is not too long, then um, the honest nodes will succeed in downloading this freshest block within the same time slot that it is produced. Now you might say, hmm, something seems, seems a little odd with this rule, because what if the adversary gets to produce a block? Um, then the adversary can attach this block wherever it wants in the block tree, right? And according to the freshest block rule, you will still download it. It might even fork off you know, far, far in the past. Right? Why would you go download this? This is not going to be the longest chain. right? And that's true. And in particular, the adversary cannot just produce one block there. It can equivocate there. It can keep you busy. right? You will be downloading all these equivocating freshest blocks. Um, and that is true. Uh, but that is not as much of a problem, because as soon as the next honest block comes around again, it will extend the longest downloaded chain and will keep downloading there. Right? And we keep moving forward um, the longest downloaded chain. And since you know, the majority of blocks, hopefully, um, is honest, we're spending at least half of our bandwidth um, not subject uh, to this adversarial spamming. Because the moment an honest, fresher block comes around, we stop downloading whatever the adversary is pr uh, proposing us to download, whatever the adversary has released, and we're only following this freshest block. Uh, and indeed, if we implement this um, again back in, in, in a testnet, um, which basically follows uh, Cardano's block synchronization logic, um, then, we, then we can see that under this download rule, um, the, the honest chain growth rate is basically restored to before the attack. OK, so this gave you uh, the intuition. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Sri Watson, who is going to guide you through the proof. So yeah, I'll uh, walk you through a bit uh, about an outline of our security proof, how we achieve provable security here. So to recap uh, how previous works deal with this, uh, there is a bounded delay model. And with the assumption that there is a bounded delay for all the blocks, uh, you can prove security. And this security is uh, of the form of this theorem that we saw earlier, where uh, if the network delay is bounded by some uh, delta, and then the adversarial stack uh, stake beta and the block production rate gamma satisfy a certain relation. Uh, then this longest chain consensus protocol satisfies both safety and liveness. How do we get this sort of security? Um, so we can look at it. So the honest nodes are building upon a longest chain like this. And since the delay is uh, can be at most uh, delta, so blocks that are produced within delta interval of each other, uh, they could end up on a fork like this. But uh, whenever the block is produced after delta time, then you're guaranteed that uh, you can down uh, the, the second block producer has basically downloaded the first block. And so this must contribute to the growth of this, uh, this honest chain. So similarly, uh, like the honest nodes can continue growing a chain with occasional forks. So effectively, this chain is growing at a rate uh, lambda h, which is, so ideally, you would want 1 minus beta fraction of the total block production. But then now it's reduced by a factor uh, uh, which depends on this uh, delay. Uh, and this is because of these occasional forks. Meanwhile, the adversary, uh, we assume, is all powerful and uh, does not face problems due to network delay. Maybe it is centralized. Um, 
And so the adversary continues to grow a chain at its uh, ideal rate, which is a beta fraction of the total block uh, production rate. And so these earlier uh, proof techniques basically end up showing that uh, with a bunch of uh, modeling and math that uh, all possible attacks on safety and liveness can be modeled as a race between these two block production processes, which is the honest blocks at this rate and the uh, adversary blocks at this rate. And so we get a guarantee that as long as this adversary rate is smaller than the honest rate, uh, which is what is summarized in this equation in the theorem, um, you have both safety and liveness. Uh, so what we did is we noticed that uh, in this proof, you actually do not use an assumption that uh, there is bounded delay for every single block, but what would be sufficient is that you have uh, that enough fraction of the honest blocks, uh, we will characterize what this enough means. If many of these honest blocks are downloaded within bounded delay, uh, then sort of the uh, honest chain continues to grow at a certain rate, and then we can get security as long as uh, uh, this, this honest uh, chain growth outnumbers the adversarial blocks. Um, and so here it's important to note that whenever uh, you have to download an honest block, you actually have to download its entire prefix uh, because otherwise you are not able to validate the honest block. Um, so that is our goal basically in this uh, security proof, which is that we want to show this kind of a claim in bandwidth constraint model. So yeah, we want to show that there is a bounded delay for enough honest blocks, including their prefix uh, in the bandwidth constraint model. And so for this, we basically define uh, something called unique slots. So as we saw the block production process earlier, um, in, in many of the slots, there will be only one single honest block uh, being proposed, and that we call as a unique slot. So let's say as an example here, one and six are unique slots, right? Um, and so the useful part of our download priority rule, uh, the freshest block rule, is that whenever there is a unique honest block, uh, that block is the freshest block, at least for some time until the next block comes in, right? So, uh, so as soon as this guy is produced, this is the freshest block. So let's take an example. Let's say the already downloaded chain was uh, the chain at the bottom, uh, one, two, four. And now you want to download the freshest block, which is uh, block six. So as long as the prefix of this block is small enough, let's say some number uh, C bar, which is a parameter we will choose. So if the prefix is small enough, then you should be able to download this in, a, uh, in some bounded amount of time, uh, which depends on your bandwidth. So to make this precise, um, we said delta H is the uh, delay for receiving the headers. Uh, there's a bandwidth constraint, which is given by C blocks per second that you can download. So if you set your uh, protocol's time slot to be uh, equal to the header delay plus, uh, plus the time it takes to download C bar number of blocks, which is what is given by C bar divided by C. So if you set your time slot like this, you can receive all the headers and as well as uh, download C bar number of blocks, which allows you to basically download the prefix, whole prefix of this honest block. And the proof technique we use um, shows that this prefix is not too large with uh, overwhelming probability, and hence you can uh, actually end up downloading the honest blocks. Uh, so, so that is what we achieved, which was our goal in this model, uh, that with the freshest block download rule, we get bounded delay for these unique honest blocks, which are a big fraction of the honest blocks at least. And this happens with overwhelming probability. So then uh, we, once we get this kind of uh, bounded delay argument in the bandwidth constraint model, we can reuse tools from earlier uh, proofs in the bounded delay model and uh, prove the security theorem. And the security theorem is of this form. Uh, like we define kappa as the security parameter, and we already saw beta as the uh, fraction of adversarial stake. So the theorem says that uh, the proof of stake longest chain protocol 
with the freshest block download rule um, with the following parameters. So we, uh, as I remarked, we would like to set the slot duration tau so that you can download C bar number of blocks. And you want to uh, do this so that all the unique honest blocks are downloaded within the same time slot with a uh, very high probability. And so for this, we required the time slot to be large enough intuitively. And more precisely, this is a large proportional to the security parameter. Um, and also the block production rate. Um, so we said that unique blocks, uh, the, the unique slots uh, you can download uh, within, the, within the time slot. And so we would like that these unique slot honest blocks outnumber uh, the adversary. And so more precisely, uh, the number of unique slots is at least half of the uh, total block producing slots. So this is similar to the honest majority assumption. So you want your uh, block production rate to be slow so that uh, you have enough unique slots to outnumber uh, the rest of the slots. Um, and finally, we have this confirmation time we talked about in the T deep rule. Uh, that also has to be large enough here, uh, proportional to like the square of the security parameter. Well, so if you have these parameters that the slot duration is large enough uh, to allow downloading enough blocks um, and you have enough confirmation time, then you can achieve safety and liveness uh, with this freshest block download rule in this bandwidth constraint model that we propose uh, with overwhelming probability and uh, over uh, polynomial in the security parameter uh, length executions. Um, okay, so that proves, that goes over the security proof, uh, but we can talk a bit about the performance under uh, bandwidth constraints. So uh, here's an illustration of the bandwidth utilization uh, of this protocol under uh, when under spamming attacks. So the red curve here shows the, uh, attack when you're implementing the longest header chain download rule. Um, and here, as you can see, so the, in the experimental setup, the nodes are limited to 20 megabits per second uh, bandwidth limit. Um, and so in this attack basically overwhelms the bandwidth completely and uh, uh, the attack goes on forever once started as we uh, actually saw in the example earlier. Move over to the freshest block download rule. Um, you can see that actually these uh, shaded blue segments, which indicate uh, what time periods the attack lasts, uh, is actually the attack only lasts for a small amount of time, and then uh, uh, and then you stop. So how this happens is we went over this whenever the freshest block is adversarial, you could be wasting a lot of bandwidth downloading their uh, spamming blocks, which is indicated by these uh, peaks in the blue curve. Whereas whenever the freshest block is honest, you go back to downloading just the honest blocks, which uh, uh, the honest nodes are not going to spam you. So uh, your bandwidth utilization is very low. Um, so on average, if you look, we are actually using only a fraction of the bandwidth. So this talks about the efficiency of the um, freshest block rule also. So we can illustrate this bandwidth uh, in a utilization in like a uh, in a bar here. Uh, so let's say the entire length of the bar represents your available bandwidth. Even in the worst case, uh, just about half of this bandwidth is consumed uh, because of this uh, spamming due to equivocations. Uh, while at the same time, uh, the green portion indicates the uh, the actual throughput, which is how fast the uh, the ledger in the end grows. Um, so while this throughput very small, in particular, it says uh, uh, it's proportional to one over the security parameter. This is because uh, you recall that we set the time slots to be proportional to the security parameter. So time slots have to be long, and hence um, the throughput uh, kind of goes down. We expect that. OK, this is a bit sad that. Uh, uh, you utilize half of your bandwidth for dealing with spamming, but only get uh, very little throughput. We can improve this. And for that, we notice that, uh, okay, so throughput is low because there are only a few block production opportunities. Blocks are produced slowly. 
but that also means that there are not too many blocks, uh, too many valid blocks in the uh, in a final confirmed chain, right? Uh, um, so let's say hypothetically uh, you've already reached consensus on the chain. Somebody has done it for you, and you have to simply passively follow the uh, longest confirmed chain. And so once the chain is confirmed because of the uh, because of the consistency, the safety properties of the protocol, uh, you can actually download this confirmed chain without uh, without being affected by spamming. So, so you only require little bandwidth to uh, like passively follow the chain. So that's shown in the top figure. So you still have the same throughput, but uh, what you need to download passively is uh, just about twice uh, the real throughput because you could have um, half of the blocks contributed by adversary, which, are, uh, which don't lead, really lead to throughput. Okay, so where is this going? We use uh, an idea from uh, earlier from this reference uh, on the top, uh, which is parallel composition of uh, longest chain protocols. So the idea is every node follows one chain, one longest chain protocol as their primary chain, but there are many, many secondary chains um, where they simply uh, passively download the confirmed chain. And so what we can get from this is uh, okay, in the primary chain, you are susceptible to a lot of spamming and utilize half of your bandwidth. But the secondary chains, you can sort of download the confirmed portion of the chains uh, more quickly uh, with less bandwidth. And so you can fit in a lot of secondary chains in your uh, leftover uh, bandwidth, basically. Uh, and so effectively what we get, if we add up all these green segments in the, in the lowest uh, bar here, it adds up to roughly one fourth of this uh, entire available bandwidth, which is good. Um, so we might expect that we have to face some bandwidth uh, loss because of the spamming attacks, but we are still able to uh, at least get throughput one fourth of the um, available bandwidth and not like uh, uh, this small tiny green bar. Uh, okay, so elaborating a bit on what this parallel chains idea is, so each node follows one primary chain, and uh, each node is actually randomly assigned one primary chain, uh, and they are responsible for maintaining consensus. So they will follow exactly the longest chain protocol with this precious block download rule that we have discussed. But this means they uh, need to face some amount of spamming. Um, so basically, the ones who are uh, ones who follow a certain chain as their primary chain are expanding some amount of bandwidth uh, and like taking one for the team in order to provide security. And so once these uh, nodes who are working on a certain chain as their primary chain, once they provide consensus, the other nodes can basically follow this chain as uh, one of their secondary chains. So each node follows many other chains as their secondary chain. And in the secondary chain, you only follow the confirmed blocks because these guys are confirmed and you cannot spam over them. Whereas these more uh, the more recent segment of the chain, you could be susceptible to spamming. Um, so this is the idea, and in the end, uh, each node will uh, accumulate all the chains, the primary and the secondary chains, and arrange them into one single ledger. Um, and this throughput of this ledger, as we saw earlier, is uh, at least about one fourth of the uh, bandwidth utilization, which is um, in particular, throughput that is independent of the security parameter. Uh, so that sort of eliminates this uh, limitation of the throughput, uh, even under the bandwidth constraint model. So yeah, with that, we can uh, conclude this particular talk uh, and we can recap the goals that we set out for this talk. So we have a bandwidth constrained network model, which enables study of first security uh, of uh, proof of stake under these equivocation based uh, spamming attacks. And we also were able to use the model to uh, characterize performance under network congestion, uh, which we did now in terms of the throughput. And we already showed that the longest chain protocol with this uh, download longest chain, uh, longest header chain, this rule is insecure. Uh, whereas there is a simple download freshest block rule, which uh, we are able to prove security for. 
uh, yeah, so that concludes the talk. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for today, today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. I want to thank both of our speakers. Had a great time listening to your presentations today, and thank you, everybody else, for um, coming and partaking in the questions at the end. If you'd like to follow along with any of the updates here at Protocol Labs Research, make sure to give our Twitter handle a follow, at Proto Research. You can also use it to keep up to date with the new seminars and new talks that we have scheduled for, for both March and April. All right, thank you again for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, guys.